Welcome back to the Tech Talks Daily Podcast. I'm your host, Neil C. Hughes, back again with another exciting episode, highlighting the urgent need for advanced security measures in a digital age, which has made it even more poignant as we mark the 50th anniversary of the first mobile phone call last month, which highlights to me that technology has drastically evolved, bringing new challenges along with it. And one of these is the worrying rise in deepfakes, sophisticated voice replication, and other forms of digital impersonation, which are increasingly being used for nefarious purposes. And as I record this podcast today, I know the OpenAI CEO is appearing before Congress, and and this is a topic that's being explored in great length. And too many organisations, especially in the financial sector, for example, are still relying on voice verification for customer access. And it's a method that's rapidly losing its robustness against these modern cyber threats. In fact, in light of recent reports, we've learned that digital injection attacks are on the rise. And we need to find better ways, not only to protect ourselves, but also our customers. So to discuss this critical topic, I've invited Andrew Budd, CEO of iProve, back onto the podcast. Because as you may remember from our last conversation, even though it was two years ago, they're a company at the forefront of face biometric verification and authentication technology. So I've invited Andrew to share his insights on why it's so crucial for organisations to move beyond simple verification to full authentication and why the general public awareness of the deep fake threats and effectiveness of biometric authentication as a anti-deep fake security measure of sorts is more important than ever. So buckle up and hold on tight because it's time for me to beam your ears all the way to London where Andrew is ready to talk about all this and much more. So a massive warm welcome back to the show. It's been two years since we last spoke but can you just remind everyone listening with a little about who you are and what you do for anyone that missed our first conversation? Absolutely, Neil. I'm um, the founder and CEO of uh, London-based iProve. As we'll discuss in a minute, we do biometric verification. We've grown about 300% since we last spoke. Um, I'm a serial entrepreneur. I've been doing this now for um, over 30 years. I don't come from the world of biometrics. I actually came out of the world of of mobile communications. I founded a business called Mblocks, which grew to be the world's largest provider of enterprise-to-consumer uh, text messaging. We sold that in 2016. Uh, and I actually began my career in an, what was then an obscure branch of engineering, which was called nuclear fusion, which has now become uh, very, very, very fashionable to my considerable surprise. But uh, for the last 10 years, I've been doing um, uh, identity and biometrics, which is an all consuming passion. Well, it's a huge pleasure to have you back on the show and 300% increase in the current climate. Kudos to you there. That's incredible. It's it's been quite a ride, hasn't it, in the last few years? COVID was a terrible t- disaster and a tragedy for many people, for many businesses. Um, but for us, it dramatically accelerated a process of tr- digital transformation, of moving processes away from in-person encounters to um, remote encounters. And that required new ways of establishing trust online. And we were there to solve that challenge. So it it, it was it was a dramatic accelerator for our business and for many others who were building the future of remote identity. And the pace of technological change has increased somewhat as well. I mean, even just seven months ago, not many people were talking about Gen AI, but of course now that's all anyone's talking about. And one of the reasons I invited you back on the podcast today is to talk about some of the trends that we're seeing and how it might impact things like security. And on, on To begin with, on that side of things, I'd love to talk about voice replication and why it's no longer a secure method for verifying customer access, especially in the financial services sector. So I'd love to bust a few myths here. Can you expand on that and why it's no longer considered a secure method? Absolutely. Let's step back a second. Yeah. Myth number one, my biometric is my password. I can reset my password, but I can't reset my biometric. That is... That is... A, a misconception, I mean, a really big misconception, because my my voice is not a secret. My face certainly isn't a secret. It's all over the place. What makes a biometric special is uh, is is actually that the genuine article is unique. 
And therefore, if I can, what really matters in biometrics is not, can I distinguish it from somebody else? That's, of course, necessary, but that's not the core of the security. What really matters is, can I distinguish the real thing from a fake? Can I distinguish the real thing from a stolen recording, from a socially engineered re re recording? Can I distinguish it from a, 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 a synthetic? Um, and what has happened, the problem with voice is that it's actually a pretty good biometric in some ways you can easily recognize people but there it's it's rather it's not there's not very much information in voice look when i was doing uh gsm when i was at the working on the dawn of, of uh, mobile communications of gsm the gsm heart rate code it could work at 12 and a half kilobits per second that's nothing so you haven't got very much information in voice to tell you whether what you're listening to is the real is the genuine article or a fake and the problem is that it's now become exceptionally easy to produce fake voices. With three seconds of a sample, you can produce a voice that will uh, fool most face recognizers. And there's very little way out of it because there is just so little information in voice with which to uh, to guide uh, a voice biometric system to, with which to enable it to distinguish between the real and the fake. And we've had some well-documented examples recently in which people have been able successfully to use modern AI tools very, very simply um, to uh, forge, to to, cop to forge and um, uh, copy somebody else's voice and get in through a voice biometric, any biometric which can easy, which can readily be forged and doesn't have enough information in it to for, for the for the 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 relying party to detect that forgery, is not a security tool. It's a security threat. And the scary thing is, it's not it's no longer just about copying or faking someone's voice. If anyone listening has seen those. Tom Cruise deep fake videos, it's almost impossible to spot that it's a, a fake Tom Cruise performing in a video. So I'm curious, on the flip side of that, I mean, the Tom Cruise side is quite amusing and uh, to watch there and share among your friends, but how are deep fakes becoming a tool for cyber criminals and how is their usage evolving? Uh, is there anything that you're seeing around there? Because I did see something from the iProve 2023 biometric threat report, uh, and maybe there's a few things in there that you can expand on too. This is stuff, things are happening with staggering and quite scary uh, speed. We've been, so deep generative AI, let's call it generative AI, of which um, deepfakes is, shall we say, a, a, a one of the tools, um, uh, has been, we've seen this coming since about 2018. Um, I first raised this topic in a House of Commons committee meeting, and there was a kind of a dead silence. And then somebody from the US NSA said, we regard this as a, as a, um, as a major threat. So this is not a surprise. Um, and we've been developing technology and working on research to combat it for many, many years. What's astonishing is the rate at which um, developments have accelerated. So even two years ago, um, deep fakes were still uh, a bit crude and a bit uh, rough. Now they are indistinguishable to the, to the human eye. Um, and that's because of the improvement in algorithms, the advance in processing power, the construction of larger of larger models. Um, anyone who has seen these knows that um, human beings can no longer tell tell the difference, and that's that's sort of that 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 is pretty scary because there has been an assumption that actually in the end, com um, machine learning might struggle to tell the difference between deep fakes and real people but human beings would be able to and that era is now over we've been monitoring the evolution um in the biometric tech landscape and we've seen some incredible things happening so for example we've seen um so if you have a deep fake the way that you introduce it into a biometric verification authentication process is what, what's called it direct injection so it doesn't go anywhere near a camera i mean look if you're if you're if you're um, a fairly primitive attacker, then you shove it onto an iPad and put it in front of the camera. But that's a very primitive way of doing it. What you do is you subvert the data flow and directly inject it. So it never went anywhere near a camera. And actually what we've seen is that it never goes anywhere near a real handset. We've seen an explosion, 149% increase between, it, between the first half and the second half of 2022 in uh, injection attacks uh, apparently originating on mobile devices. That's a huge change because in the old days they used to originate on desktops, which are very easy to subvert. And it was always thought that mobile devices could be protected against that. Not anymore. When you see 150 percent increase in attacks, you know that the attackers have broken through, and they're able to um, to deliver injection attacks through mobile devices 
even though the apps have been built to withstand those sorts of attacks. And what it says is the attackers have, 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 broken, those, have broken those. The second is that we've, we saw, between the, between the first half and the second half of 2022, we saw a 300, 295% increase, a quadrupling in, uh, the, in, in the incidence of uh, novel forms of face swapping. So face swap attacks used to be quite sort of um, used to be quite sort of primitive. We saw a new form of face swapping, which was very realistic and very straightforward to put together. And in in a six month period, it just exploded onto the internet. But again, when that happens, it says that the attackers haven't have found that it works. They don't replicate like that unless unless it, unless it works. And that also shows, for example, that another thing that shows that is that we've seen bursts of attacks. Um, automated, digitally injected attacks, which kind of suddenly suddenly appear and burst out in bursts of 100 or 200 within a day, originating who knows where, um, and spreading all over the world. Because clearly people have built attack kits that work. These Typically what they're attacking is uh, motion-based uh, liveness detection. So the, the face verification systems that rely upon people moving or talking to detect liveness, and these attacks spread out all over the world because clearly the attackers have found um, a vulnerability in these systems, and they just kind of try it out everywhere. These are these are things that are familiar from the from the from other parts of the cybersecurity world. What is novel is that deep fakes have clearly created successful attacks that work in the biometric world, and they're going they're cheap to implement, and they're going worldwide. And of course, the belts and braces approach to corporate IT and service delivery leverages things like change management to uh, have a more future mindset before anything is implemented. What knock-on effect is this going to have? But over the last 20 years, we've witnessed what happens when big tech ignores those uh, processes and just moves fast and break things. It, it, are, are you noticing a change in attitude? Are people more cautious now and more responsible? Or, or are we still like little children playing with sophisticated toys without understanding the dangers that we could be creating? What we're seeing is an absolutely huge variety, a huge range of attitudes uh, between countries and between sectors on this. So, for example, within the European Union, um, the public authorities responsible for the for the future of cybersecurity and the future of digital identity across the continent are acutely aware, incredibly aware of the true of the true scale of the threats, and are thinking very deeply about the real problems to address. But we're seeing, uh, for example, banks in other country in other countries and other territories taking what I would describe as a cavalier approach, box ticking, so that they can. Um, they can demonstrate to the regulators that at least they did something, but they don't do an adequate risk assessment of what they're actually facing. They don't uh, consider uh, what the downside of this and the scale of these downsides might may be. And in some cases, they're making what, in my view, are very serious mistakes because they just don't take the threat seriously enough. So we see this incredible range between the 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 um, Somewhat complacent box stickers and the those who are acutely focused and different organisations in different territories fall along that spectrum. And as generative AI technologies advance and deep fakes become more sophisticated, for any business leaders listening, what steps should their organisations be taking to protect themselves and indeed their customers from from threats like we're raising today? The key takeaway on this is um, biometric authentication and biometric verification are tools of incredible um, power and advantage in terms of delivering convenience, delivering inclusive and ubiquitous access to trust. So biometrics are a fantastic thing, but this rapid rate of change means you can't buy biometrics as software. You have to buy it as a service because behind that biometric software and behind that biometric technology, there has to be a whole architecture uh, an organization and business processes watching the evolution of these attacks, learning from the evolution of these attacks, adapting to the evolution of the attacks, and evolving the technology so that it stays ahead of the attackers. It's not an impossible task, but it requires um, technology, people, and processes to 
continually evolve the technology to stay ahead of um, this rapidly changing um, AI, uh, AI environment. So the key message is it's no longer, it, bi you, biometrics are becoming a user requirement, but it's no longer acceptable to, to purchase biometrics as a software. You have to buy it as a service with proper security operations behind it, just as you would buy any other cybersecurity solution as a, as a managed, monitored, maintained service, rather than as, it, it, with my rather old view of things, buying a disk of software. That time is over. And another area I've seen confused very often is the difference between verifying and authenticating customers. So just to lay a few things to rest here, can you explain the difference between verifying and authenticating customers and why it's actually more crucial for organizations to prioritize the latter? I think organizations need to prioritize both, to tell yeah. you, Neil, because so verifying a user is when you set up their user account. Every organization that deals with remote users um, needs to establish the account. They need to enroll the user. They need to give them. Uh, they need to give them credentials. They need to give them access. So the creation of a user account um, requires the onboarding of a person, the enrollment of a person, and that's a very dangerous moment. That is a very dangerous moment because if you allow an attacker to um, to to uh, attain control over an account at the time at which it's created the long-term value that they can extract um, from that account they control is, is immense. And it's really important. You could, there's, when you set up an account, you can gather all sorts of information about the person. You can gather all sorts of biographics, all sorts of data points about them, but you're not really learning anything about the human being behind that. So at some point, you have to bind that set of attributes that you've uh, built around the account. To a real life human being, human trust doesn't reside in um, files of data. Trust resides in what goes on between people's ears. And so at some point, you have to bind that set of attributes to a human being. And thanks to, thanks to generative AI, AI, that is a really dangerous moment. So you need to verify that you're dealing with the right person, a real person, and somebody there, right present, right there, right now when you allow that account to be set up and um and trust vested in the in the owner of that and then when they come back you've got to make sure time and time again that they are the same person we have a habit in our economy of uh trusting in uh, in in proxies uh, one very one very commonly used way of of authenticating user when they come back to assert control over their identity is to send them a text message a one time passcode um, I, I remember when this began because I was running the world's largest text messaging business. We did we did very well out of it. Thank you. Um, the problem with text messages is it's becoming increasingly well known. They were, they, the network can be subverted, but also it's very susceptible to social engineering. And we've seen loads of frauds worldwide in which uh, elaborate social engineering mechanisms have been adapted, both for, amongst consumers and uh, in, in enterprises, in which this one-time passcode is 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 in, in which attackers gain control of this one-time passcode, so these proxies, which can either which can be wittingly, uh, unwittingly, or in some cases is wittingly shared with somebody else, uh, aren't adequate anymore. Which is why biometrics are going to become increasingly powerful as a means of authenticating both consumers and employees in the enterprise. Um, because for one for one of the reasons being you can't share a biometric knowingly or unknowingly at least uh, not without a scalp my in the case of my face not without a scalp and an enormous amount of blood um mm -hmm. i'm sorry to your listeners for that the non-shareability of a biometric especially a face biometric makes it a very powerful tool for uh for the for the authentication of returning users who are asserting very precious control um over their identity if and only if you can be sure that you're dealing with a live genuinely present person and not a generative ai deepfake so the root of trust increasingly um in identity in the future will be can i be sure that this is the right person but a real person and present right now not a generative ai and that's that's frankly is the the rather daunting role the rather daunting task that we've set ourselves
And when looking across the threat landscape, I think it's fascinating that both sides of the scale from overconfidence to unsuspecting victims are both intensifying this deep threat, deep fake threat. So can you expand on that again and, and maybe offer a few insights on, on what measures can be put in place to oh, to better raise awareness and, cautious, uh, and caution around this? Well, the first thing is that the deep fake threat has been around for a number of years, but it wasn't appreciated. Yeah. Uh, all the publicity around large language models, around GPT-4, around stable diffusion, all this has and, and the, the rapid development that we're seeing, all that has uh, very dramatically raised uh, awareness um, amongst, the, amongst the, the enterprises who have to make these risk decisions, just what they're facing. You know, we talked about deep fakes a couple of years ago, everyone went, yeah, whatever. Um, now that's not, not the case anymore. Um, but then, then a risk assessment has to be made to say, Assuming the attacker is armed with this kind of technology, what can they do to us? How bad can it be? My experience, frankly, is that if you can see a risk that could potentially crystallize, crit that could potentially crystallize, and you you don't heed it, it will come back and bite you. I, I, a very quick story about the found, about um, the foundation of iProof Neil back in two thousand and eight. Um, my previous company, Mblox, was had become the world's largest processor of mobile payments in the world. We were doing settled about five hundred million dollars a year, and but we hadn't adequately understood the uh, the risks that we were running. With the result that cyber criminals were able to use our network to steal money from people from millions of people over a period of of, of of six months. So we went from being the darlings of the industry to potentially the bad boys incredibly quickly. It exploded on us. And um, when this all blew up, I, I was pulled on television and asked by a journalist, Mr. Bud, um, the role of your company in this scandal, were you complicit or just recklessly incompetent? Well, um, in, the, in the end, after the investigations took place, the regulator said we'd in fact behaved in an exemplary manner. But I think it's important that organizations take their risk assessments seriously so that they are never unhappy. They never find themselves being asked that question in practice. And with the explosion of generative AI, nobody can, can claim ignorance about this. So I think organizations need to do serious risk assessments. I mean, today, for example, um, a lot of organizations rely on location, for example, as a risk signal. Everyone knows it's extremely trivial to forge a location for a, for a, crim for a, a criminal device. So you have every, one has to take into account the fact that um, a lot of methods used today are what I would describe as idiot traps. They catch the they catch the attacker who's an idiot, um, but they don't stop the serious attackers. So a lot of organisations have to understand that a lot of the risk fact, a lot of the risks of the of the measures that they put in place, tell them things. If the test fails, so for example, if the location is in the wrong place, you've learned something, but they don't tell them anything if they pass. And that asymmetric knowledge is a bit um, uncomfortable and a bit uh, unfamiliar to, to many organizations. Um, that's why strong genuine presence assurance, strong liveness assurance is one of the, is one of the techniques which actually provides um, symmetric knowledge. You know a lot about, you, it tells you a lot if you pass just as much as if you as if you fail, and I think organisations need to do their risk assessments much more carefully than they're doing at the moment. And we have talked about the threat from deep fakes and how it will only increase. But as a solutions rather than problems kind of guy, I'm going to ask you now if you can talk a little bit about the positive impact and also the effectiveness of things like biometric authentication as a anti deep fake security measure, and also how does iProof's face biometric verification and authentication technology, how does that help in the context of our conversation today? Look, we're going to see a tremendous explosion in the use of generative AI as a creative medium to do all sorts of uh, interesting and unexpected unexpected things which will add value um, into the economy. The key thing going forward is that people know whether they are dealing with with uh, a, with a with an AI avatar or with the real person, because it's not going to be obvious anymore. Human beings will not be able to tell the difference. So, what's going to matter is this kind of disclosure, and and our technology is there to ensure that people are being told 
the truth. How do we do that? Well, um, the visible part of our technology is something called the IPU flash mark, um, which I, I, have to, I, I, I have to say I invented about um, 11 years ago. What we do is we use the screen of the user's device to illuminate their face with a rapidly changing sequence of colors. That just sequence is cryptographically generated in our servers and sent to the device, so a, a, an attacker in control of the device cannot know what that sequence of colors is going to be. While the user's face is being illuminated, we send video back to our servers where we analyze the reflection of that screen illumination from the user's face, from the way it's on the spatial and spectral characteristics of the reflection and how it interacts with the ambient illumination, which is a very potent source of, 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 uh, of, of, of salting. Um, we can tell whether we're looking at a um, skin-covered, live, uh, human face-shaped 3D object. And from the sequence of colors, which has to be right and not wrong, we can tell whether we're looking at a person that is uh, uh, there, present there, right there, right there, right now. So we create effectively a one-time biometric, and then we look, and that's incredibly rich. There's enormous amounts of data there, and um, we're able to analyze spatial, spectral, and these te temporal signals together to extract the tiny, tiny, tiny signals of falseness that, having done about, having done maybe a billion um, uh, liveness tests, we know are there. Our big advantage over the enormously well-resourced forces against us, be it organized crime or nation states, is that we have more data about what genuinely present people illuminated from their screens look like than they do. And we're continuing to, um, to, to analyze and uh, develop that knowledge all the time, which is why the, uh, the, our uh, iFood's Biometric Security Operations Center is such a vital and unique asset in all of this. Um, we, we triage the millions and millions of uh, verifications that take place, sometimes a million in a day, to extract the, that tiny number that represent attacks. And then we analyze those attacks to understand whether what we're looking at are novel techniques and whether the deep fakes that we're looking at um, show changing properties. And then we, um, if we learn from that and evolve our systems continuously, um, to make sure that our systems are stay ahead of uh, the attackers. If you don't have that kind of active threat intelligence and active threat management, uh, your system won't last a more than a month out in the wild. And that's how we're able to provide a source of trust that the human face of the person that we think we're looking at uh, over the internet is actually them, and not a um, and not a, 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 a generative deepfake. And we're going to see generative deepfakes a lot. I recently wrote a blog, which I'd um, recommend people go and read on LinkedIn, in which I, I discussed um, how we're likely to see the development of uh, generative AI avatars of us, which we can pass on to our heirs after we die, so that, uh, like Harry Potter in Dumbledore's study. Um, People of the next generation can come and ask our advice after we're dead. To me, this is a very weird and peculiar idea, but I have no doubt that it's going to happen. And it'll be essential that people have uh, guarantees and measures of genuineness, and that's our core mission, to, and it's our core mission to supply those. And I think if we look back in the last seven months alone, generative AI has smashed into the mainstream, and I've been a full four or five big tech conferences in the US this year and every big tech company you can think of are all declaring that they're ahead of the curve and there's a certain amount of bandwagon jumping there. But I, I would imagine that this will further ramp up the speed of te technological change and uh, also increase the speed in which the threat landscape will evolve. So with all this in mind, you probably see all this coming uh, a long time ago, but what's on the horizon for iProof? How are your systems going to evolve and can you share any plans or projects that you're particularly excited about right now? I appreciate there's probably not too much you can share, but is there anything you can? So task number one for us on the horizon is do what we do today, is, is deliver what we do today, which is high confidence that you're looking at a, at, at, at a genuinely present person, to do that tomorrow and the day after and next year and the year after. Because as you say, as the, as the generative AI threat increases, 
So we have to run extremely fast and invest very heavily just to keep delivering that same level of trust. Um, so in a sense, we're like a hamster wheel. We're like a hamster on a hamster wheel where the wheel is spinning faster and faster. And someone says to the hamster, what, 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 what's going to keep you busy tomorrow? Yeah. Uh, and that hamster wheel is going to throw more and more of our competitors out because it is such a uh, demanding and uh, focused activity. We are, however, very excited about some of the um, some of the applications of this technology. Um, so, if you can trust a remote person who is uh, using an a, a using an a, an untrusted device in an untrusted context, then you can you can assert what I call the centrality of the couch. I'm afraid that makes that makes my marketing people's ears bleed. But I like it. <laughs> and one of the big applications for this is crossing borders. Today, when you cross a border, when you take, when you, for example, travel by train from St. Pancras to, to, to France, um, there is a moment of great security um, check. There's a security check of enormous importance that takes place in St. Pancras station itself, which is a, uh, a place with very little space and very little time. And if anything, uh, and that means you get a lot of queues, and those queues are only going to get worse as um, more and more checks have to be made. The way to solve that is to assert the centrality of the couch, is to move those checks that take time and so that take time and effort away from the confined space of St. Pancras and into the user's home. So um, we, we, we have developed together with Eurostar a technology that enables people to um, register their passport, register their, their biometric, a picture of how they look today, register their ticket um, at, when they're sitting at home and then with our partners and trust, um, it's connected through to the USR ticketing systems. And then when the user is turns up at the at, at St. Pancras station, there's a, 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 a new generation of biometric authentication technology, which we as IPU have developed. Um, that's like kind of like a portal and enables people in, to just walk through up to four people abreast, just walk through it without stopping at, at high throughputs. Uh, and their names are kind of their their faces are checked off against the list of people expected that day, and they're able to skip ticket checks and skip UK border check UK border exit checks, thereby dramatically reducing uh, queuing time, uh, pressure of space, and so on. This is going to be revolutionary in due course. We hope that um, border entry checks such as done by the British done by the UK in 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 Belgium and Holland and done by the French on entry into Schengen in, in St Pancras that those two will be automated uh, in that way so that we will genuinely enter an, a, a realm in which um you do your security checks on your couch at home and then you just walk through the border um and you know if you're if you're if you're not a, if you're not registered or you're somebody very suspect that a big burly person will step out of the shadows and intercept you to have a conversation about why an exception has been thrown, um, but hopefully, and deal with you in a very courteous and respectful way. Uh, and hopefully, this will this will produce a dramatically improved experience for travellers. It'll it'll speed things up. It'll mean that more trains can leave every day for St Pancras. It'll reduce stress uh, and enhance security very much. I would emphasize this is not face recognition. This is not surveillance, and nobody will be compelled to do this. I don't think we'll, well, I don't think we will or should ever, ever uh, reach a circumstance where people are compelled to do this. It'll be an option that people can choose to do to maximize their own convenience. Um, and it's an authentication technology or surveillance technology. But if you haven't enrolled in the system, and if you haven't walked up to the smart check entry port deliberately and voluntarily, um, then your face will will not be will not be checked. It's very important that face biometrics are used for verification and not for recognition, because in verification, the user has control, they have consent, they have knowledge of what they're doing it, they have agency, they get personal benefit from doing it, and their privacy is respected. Those are very important attributes of face verification, which is uh, the basis of everything we do, and completely different from uh, face recognition, which is used in surveillance, which is a completely different uh, industry and a completely different business and not something we're getting involved in.
And I think when organizations are um, thinking about implementing biometrics, it's really important that they um, pay attention to the inclusion aspects. It's it's really not okay to produce technology, to produce a, a verification, authentication methods, methods of establishing trust, which depend upon the user having a particular handset, having spent, having bought something that was at the top of the market, having a particular capability or facility with technology, both for public and for large-scale enterprise applications, you really need to ensure and look after inclusion. That means no discrimination on the basis of age, no discrimination on the basis of gender, no discrimination on the basis of ethnic background or skin tone, and no discrimination on the basis of device choice. These are sometimes neglected, but they're very important if one is to build trust um, in this technology, which after all is all about trust. Well, I cannot thank you enough for coming back on the podcast today, sharing your insights. But before I let you go, I'm going to ask you to leave everybody listening with one final gift. And that is a book that has inspired you or something you can recommend or a song that means something to you that we can add to our Spotify playlist. But all I'm going to ask is, what would you like to leave us with today and why? I'll offer you both, Neil. Look, I come from that generation in which um, books are uh, part of our domestic um, and domestic decorations. So we have bookshelves and bookshelves. So trying to pick out one yeah. um, w- w- was very difficult. Look, when I first read Crossing the Chasm by Jeffrey Moore, uh, I was very angry with him because uh, he had written, he had dissected my professional career. He had mercilessly exposed all the mistakes, the erroneous decisions, the misconceptions I'd made to public, to, to public opprobrium. And he'd done so without asking my permission. In fact, Neil, he'd done it without having the courtesy of knowing I existed. <laughs> it is an, um, Jeffrey Moore's book, uh, Jeffrey Moore's book on crossing the chasm and bubble inside the tornado are awe inspiring. And I've used them as, as low, as, as North stars in my business strategy for, for 30 years. When it comes to music, um, uh, I'll st- I, one of the pieces of music that I always come back to is, uh, is the uh, overture to Handel's Messiah. Before the call, start, so before the call um, pieces began, and Man of the Messiah was the first piece of call singing that I ever engaged in, um, there was this wonderful Baroque architectural piece. You see, um, you, see, you, see, you see Christopher Wren staircases opening up amongst you. Um, magnificent uh, architectural vistas in that music. It is, it is, it, one cannot, I can't listen to it often enough. Fantastic. Well, I'll add the book and the music to our Spotify playlist and obviously the book to our Amazon wish list. And for anyone listening, just wanting to explore the topic a little bit deeper, for all things I prove and maybe some of the things we talked about today, where would you like to point everyone listening to check out? Naturally, I, our website, I prove, that's I P R O O V, I prove dot com is an absolute treasury of 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 content our blogs have all sorts of interesting discussions um and you can also come to my linkedin uh, account andrew budd um where you'll find occasional musings on the sorts of topics we've just discussed um usually dressed up as a as a as a, as a story or as an or, or or based on a metaphor Well, we started the podcast today talking about uh, the journey we've been on over the last few years. One thing we did forget to mention was it was the 50th anniversary of the first mobile phone call in April. We've gone from there to how businesses can use biometric authentication technology to combat fraud techniques such as voice replication and many others and also uh, around deep fakes and the rise of generative AI. I think it's something we could talk about for hours. We will have to get you back on much sooner than two years next time. But thanks again um, for joining me on the podcast today. Really appreciate your time, Andrew. Thank you so much for inviting me, Neil. It's been a pleasure. So there you have it. Andrew is officially friend of the podcast after his second appearance here. And he kind of thank him enough for shedding a little extra light on the pressing need for advanced security measures in the face of evolving cyber threats let's face it receiving a text message or using your voice is not as secure as it once was and as we've learned today the threat posed by deep fakes and voice replication is very real and growing but the good news is strong verification biometric authentication can provide effective defenses And as we continue to embrace this digital revolution, I think it's also crucial for businesses everywhere to stay one step ahead and ensure the safety of their customers' sensitive information 
And we all know with the likes of GDPR and other legislations in here, the cost of not doing that can be incredibly expensive, not just for financial reasons, but reputational damage that can take literally five, ten years to get over. So a big thank you to Andrew for sharing his expertise and insights with us. If you would like to join the conversation, email me techblogwriter at outlook.com, Twitter, LinkedIn, Instagram at Neil C. Hughes. Let me know your thoughts. But that's it for today. So remember, if you've got one takeaway from our conversation today, technology is only as strong as the security that protects it. So stay tuned for more insights and conversations. Hope you'll join me again tomorrow. But thank you for listening as always. And until next time, don't be a stranger.